All right, are there any questions? So last time we were almost finishing up the chapter on clustering, all right? And we were looking at uh, measures of performance, all right? Inter internal validation, where you just use the data, right? So, and the heuristic here was that you want tight clusters and clusters that are separated cleanly from each other. So there were these two indices that you could use, right? One of them is called the, the davis bolden index, all right? And the idea here is that if, you have a, if your algorithm has done a good clustering job, the clusters should be widely separated, right? And they should also be tight. So the sigma should typically be small, and the delta, which is the distance between different clusters, that should be large, right? So that being the case, the way in which you have defined this alpha p, uh, p right? Here, del delta should be large, sigma should be small. So having alpha small is a good thing, all right? So low value of alpha is desirable, whereas this other index, which is called the Dunn index, all right? If you apply the same logic, you want the sigmas to be small, the dispersion in the cluster to be small, and the between, between cluster distances to be large. So this quantity should be, should be large, okay? That'll be a good thing, right? And again, I mean, you can pick anything you like for these sigmas and this delta, right? And if you want uh, classes that are far apart, if you want to make sure that the clusters are wide apart, right, what you probably would choose for delta would be the minimum distance, right, the distance between the closest elements in the two clusters, right, in the two different clusters. Uh, if you want to get tight classes, maybe you would choose the diameter of the class as that measure of dispersion, right. Diameter is the maximum spread among the elements in that class, right. Now, since these kinds of measures do not possess any predictive capability, it's all based on heuristics, it appears difficult to assess their worth, even what it means to be worthy. But there have been simulation studies to observe how they behave. And the, the danger of relying on heuristic validation has been uh, demonstrated in a study which has shown weak correlation between many validation indices and clustering error across various clustering algorithms and random point processes. Okay. But, you know, these are most of them, time, you know, it's not mathematicians, engineers are using them. Okay, so you have some data, and if it clusters properly, you don't worry about the general case, okay? What is going to happen in the most uh, general case or on, 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 the, on the particular distribution? So, but, but this is an area that is full of uh, hand-waving. All right, any questions? So we finished classification, all right? We looked at clustering, all right? Now we're going to move on to genetic regulatory networks, all right? Because the genes, they interact with each other in a multivariate fashion, right? And you've seen that in, in the eukaryotic genome when there is transcription, right? Uh, like, it's not just enough to have RNA polymerase. You need a whole bunch of transcription factors, okay? And things can influence transcription from a large distance, right? So in the, in the case of prokaryotic cells, it's usually just one molecule that is controlling transcription. But in the case of eukaryotes, it's a whole bunch of things, okay? And the biologists typically look at it as a you know, uh, correlation between two things, okay? They do not take the multivariate picture into account, right? So when we are going to look at genetic regulatory networks, we basically want to uh, study the multivariate effects, right? It's not enough to just observe two genes in isolation. There may be a large number of genes here that are involved, right? And we have to study the holistic behavior of the genes, right? So that is what is involved in genetic regulatory networks. So a central focus of genomic research concerns understanding the manner in which cells execute and control the enormous number of operations that are required for normal function and the ways in which cellular systems fail in disease, okay? Like we have already seen that, like if you have an oncogene turning on, you could get uncontrolled cell proliferation leading to cancer, right? Or a tumor suppressor, which is like a break on cell division turning off, right? That also would be problem problematic. Now, in biological systems, decisions are reached by methods which are exceedingly parallel and extraordinarily integrated, right? You've seen, I mean, so many different things have to kick in, right? And the right protein has to be expressed in the right cell at the right time, right? So, as with any robust system, you can expect that, you know, for a biological system, there will be feedback, right? And, and damping, these have to be routine, right? For the most common of activities. Like, even if, if the weather is very hot, okay? Like you sweat, right? Then your perspiration evaporates, right? That produces cooling, you know? So there is, there is feedback mechanism, right? Now, the traditional biochemical and genetic characterizations of genes do not facilitate 
rapid sifting of these possibilities to identify the, the genes that are involved in different processes or the control mechanisms employed. Like if you do, a, if you pick up one gene, okay, you do its analysis, you look at the shape of the protein and all that, you may not get the entire story because there are so many things that are interacting together, okay. However, when methods do exist to focus genetic and biochemical uh, characterization procedures on a smaller number of genes likely to be involved in a process, progress in finding the relevant interactions and controls can be substantial, right. And a good example of that is metabolism, right. See, in a lot of situations, there is this um, marginal information that is available that is called pathway knowledge, right? The biologists believe, you know, when this protein acts in this way, then something else will happen, okay? This one regulates that one, then the next one, and so on, okay? But it's not really uh, very solid knowledge because it's probably in a particular experiment under a control condition, right? So if you change some other variables, you might get a different outcome, right? However, in the case of metabolism, right, those pathways have been figured out completely, right? Because first of all, they've been studied in lower level organisms, right? Like you're probably looking at bacteria or yeast, right? And you have steps along the metabolic pathway. So you've done experiments where you take away a particular enzyme and see what happens, okay? Then you know which enzyme catalyzes and so on, okay? So the earliest understandings of the me mechanics of cellular gene control were derived in large measure from the studies of metabolism in cells, right? And in metabolism, it is possible to use biochemistry to identify the stepwise modi modifications of the metabolic intermediates and genetic complementation tests. That means if you're worried about a particular molecule, you'll take that out, okay? Mess around with the gene that is producing that molecule and then see the effect, okay? So you can do these things to identify the genes which are responsible for catalysis of these steps and those genes and the cis regulator elements involved in the control of their expression. So because, see, the whole human genome has been sequenced, okay? There, it's 3 billion plus nucleotides, right? It took 13 years, all right? $4 billion, all right? You sequenced it. But now, that's a whole bunch of data, okay? I mean, it's not information, right? You don't know which gene controls which one, okay? You need to figure that out, right? So in the case of metabolism, it, it was comparatively easy. But in general, you know, uh, if, if you just look at cellular behavior, all right? I mean, it's not that easy to figure that out because it's a whole bunch of things coming together and the overall effect is what you see, right? In, in, the, in the phenotypic level, right? So in the case of me metabolism, starting from the basic outline of the process, the molecular biologists and biochemists have been able to build up a very detailed view of the processes and regulatory interactions operating within the metabolic domain. In fact, they are there in the books. Even the, the, the molecular biology book that we are using as a reference, that has a chapter that is devoted to that, okay? Like if you're running glycolysis, that is the splitting of six carbon sugar glucose into two, three carbon sugars, there is a series of 10 steps that are involved, each one catalyzed by an enzyme, right? And then after that, you know, you use oxygen uh, and, and uh, you basically produce carbon dioxide and water. There are a number of steps involved and it is known, okay? People have exact knowledge about which, which enzyme catalyzes which step, right? How much energy is produced and so on, okay? So they know, you know, what the controls are on those reactions. But for the general, uh, you know, class of reactions in cells, we don't know, right? So in contrast for most cellular processes, general methods to implicate likely participants and to suggest control relationships have not emerged from these classical approaches. So the resulting inability to produce overall schemata for most cellular processes has meant that gene function has been for the most part determined in a piecemeal fashion. Like you focus on a small part of the genome, right, and find out the function, right? But the overall picture is, is, is not figured out. So once a gene is being suspected of being involved in a particular process, you basically hone in on that gene, right, and the others that are controlling it, or you believe control it, and then try to study the behavior, right. So this will typically result in the full breadth of important roles for well-known, highly characterized genes being slowly discovered. Like for some genes we know, like P53, we know the roles of P53, it's been extensively studied. You know? So a good example of this is the relatively recent appreciation that oncogenes such as MYC, MYC can stimulate apoptosis in addition to proliferation. So, you know, MYC is an oncogene, right? You, re you remember what an oncogene is, okay? It's basically a proto-oncogene, right? A, a gene that is supposed to turn on cell division, all right, or accelerate cell proliferation when, the, when there is a need, okay? If that gets mutated, then you get an oncogene. So MYC is an example of an oncogene, right? But it can not only stimulate 
cell proliferation, but it can also stimulate programmed cell death or apoptosis, right? So, but it took a long time to discover the, that it could also stimulate apoptosis because you don't have the complete picture, right? So, because transcriptional control is accomplished by a complex method that interprets a variety of inputs, remember all the transcription fa factors that are getting on, onto the RNA polymerase, okay? So, all of them have a contribution. If, if all those transcription factors are not expressed at the right time, right? At the right location, you're not going to have transcription, right? So, because of this, the development of analytical tools which are able to detect multivariate influences on decision making present in complex genetic networks is essential. Right. So you, it's not enough to just have univariate tools. Right. Now, modeling and analysis of gene regulation, that means how the genes regulate each other, genes and proteins regulate each other, can substantially help to unravel the mechanisms underlying gene regulation and to understand gene function. Right. See, in cancer, it is disruption of gene function. Okay. So you're looking at the disease state. But if you, if you look at prenatal development, okay, a single fertilized egg developing into an individual, okay, so there are a lot of controls over there. Okay. One gene controlling the other, something else, and, and, you know, there is also control not only in time, right, but also in space, right, because your eyes have to appear at the right locations. You don't want your eyes in the middle of your legs, you know, so that kind of thing. So this modeling and analysis of gene regulation can have a profound effect on developing techniques for drug testing and therapeutic intervention for effective, tre effective treatment of disease, because when the... Re when the genetic regulation is disrupted, right, that's when you're going to have different diseases. All right, All right any questions? Now, if you're looking at genetic regulatory system, that means genes regulating each other, right, then there are two aspects, all right, that, that you have to take into account. The first one is the topology, the connectivity structure. Not every, although we, it is multivariate, all right, not every gene is going to affect every other gene, right? So, in, so, you know, if you write down the interaction matrix, that'll be a pretty sparse one, okay. So, you need to know the topology in order to st study this uh, network kind of behavior, and you also need to know the set of interactions between the elements which will determine the dynamical behavior of the system, right. So, exploration of the relationship between topology and dynamics may lead to valuable conclusions about the structure, behavior, and properties of genetic regulatory systems, right. And, you know, even before all this, genomics became a, an important area, right? People have studied, you know, multivariate systems, right? If you have many different variables, what do you do? You write down differential equations, right, about the interaction of, of, of these different variables with each other, right? So the same methods have also been applied in genomics, too. So numerous mathematical and computational methods have been proposed for, con uh, for construction of formal mo models of genetic interactions, right? And we will talk about some of them. So these models, they share certain characteristics. The first one is that they represent systems, right? Because you're looking at the holistic picture, right? You're just not focusing on one molecule, right? So they represent systems in, the, in that they characterize an interacting group of components forming a whole, right? And can be viewed as a process that results in a transformation of signals and generate outputs in response to input sim stimuli, right? They are also dynamical in that they capture the time varying quality of the physical process under study and they can change their own behavior over time, right? They can also be considered to be generally nonlinear, right? In that, you know, a linear system, if you give it two different inputs, all right, and then you present the sum of the inputs, the output is just the superposition of the inputs, all right? If it's a nonlinear system, it's different, okay? So, so typically cellular behavior is nonlinear. So they, they can, so if you're going to model uh, cellular behavior using uh, genetic regulatory networks, then this will be like a nonlinear system. So in, the, in that, the interactions within the system will yield behavior which is more complicated than just the sum of the behaviors of the agents. Right. And these characteristics, these two or three, these three characteristics here, they basically characterize nonlinear dynamical systems. Okay. So this is an area of engineering or of math, okay, where you have a uh, you know, system that is described by nonlinear differential equations. Okay. Of course, the problem here is that you don't have Newton's law, okay, to give you those equations, right? Newton's law or, or you know, whatever, heat, heat flow balance or, you know, distillation column and all that, okay, because this is some system that engineers do not build, right? So if you're looking at nonlinear dynamic systems, they are composed of states, input and output signals, 
and transition operators between states and output operators, okay? Like, you know, the state transition equation, how you go from one state to the other, right? And then, of course, how uh, the states are mapped into the outputs that you observe. So most of the attempts to model gene regulatory networks fall within the scope of nonlinear dynamical systems, including what are called probabilistic graphical models, right? They will tell you what the transition probability is, okay? He's looking at the earlier state, right? such as Bayesian networks is one, neural networks, and differential equations. Right. So based on more recent evidence from genomics, nonlinear dynamical systems appear to provide the appropriate framework to support the modeling of genomic systems. Right. Now, so you're going to model this biological system as a nonlinear dynamical system, right? Now, if you want to build a model, right, this will require abstracting from the specifics of the problem and the breadth of nonlinear dynamical systems will, will give you a lot of freedom. You, know, you, can, you have many different kind of systems where you can have differential equations. You can have uh, equ equations with uh, you know, logic functions in them and so on. Okay? And people have used all kinds of uh, different systems to carry out this kind of modeling. So many of concepts that are relative, relevant to genomic regulation have been characterized from the perspectives of mathematical theory estimation of model parameters and application paradigms. One important characteristic of biological systems is what is called the, the ability to maintain homeostasis. It's extremely stable, right? Like, see, your temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? You put you in cold weather, your temperature still stays the same, unless you're sick or something like that, okay? Or put you in real hot weather, so you adapt, okay? It's within, yeah, if they put you in 1,000 degrees, of course, you're dead, okay? Or 200 degrees, but, you know, within a narrow range, there, there is extreme adaptability, right? So structural stability is a property of a dynamical system. It concerns the persistent behavior of a system under perturbation, right? So it is stable, right? You perturb it, it's, it's stable. So it captures the idea of behavior that is not destroyed by small, again, the, the you know, the emphasis here is on small changes, okay? Not on large changes to the system. So this is certainly a property of real genetic networks since the cell must be able to maintain homeostasis which is the ability of living systems to maintain internal equilibrium in the face of external perturbations and stimuli. Right. Uncertainty relative to model behavior and knowledge acquisition has been extensively explored. Then uh, information theory. Right. How many people are in information theory here? Nobody? Or right. oh, you are ashamed to reveal your identity or what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is in information theory, you guys use entropy and all that, right? I mean, so you can use the entro uh, the, uh, these concepts too in when you're doing this gene regulatory network modeling, right? And people have done it. Some, some people have already done that. Okay? So information theory traditionally used for communications technology applications is well suited uh, to study uncertainty measures quantified through the use of probability theory, right? That is basically the entropy that you calculate, okay? whatever, Shannon entropy. Another characteristic of living organisms is this distributed control, right? So distributed control is common for complex systems, such as living organisms, which have the property that no single agent is singularly in control of the system behavior. Rather, the control is dispersed among all agents with varying le levels of influence, right? And this is the current view of genetic regulatory ne networks. Then in addition, see, we are not interested in just modeling the genetic regulatory network, okay? Well, you'll understand that, but we also want to be able to intervene, to control, to alter the behavior of the genetic regulatory network, right? If it is misbehaving, we want to restore it to the earlier behavior, right? Or, and if that cannot be done, we want that particular cell to die, okay? So that is the objective. So, I mean, control, uh, c controlling that uh, network to get it to move from, you know, undesirable states to desirable states would be an objective, right, for therapeutic purposes. So to significantly change the global behavior of a system in a desired manner via external control, it is necessary to consider the effects holistically. Right? You have to consider the entire system. You cannot just say, I'm going to take part of the system and control it. So this property is consistent with the inherent global stability of genetic networks in the presence of small changes to the system.
Now, if you're going to control a system, if you're going to control a genetic regulated network, you need to know what the modulators are that are available to you, okay? If you, if you take a course in control, they will tell you what the control input is, okay? If, you, if it's, a, you know, let's say the temperature in this room, right, and if it's during winter time, it's the heat flow to the furnace, okay? Or it's a thermostat setting or something like that, okay? But in order to be able to control a genetic regulated network, you must have controllability, okay? The variable that you're going to manipulate, that should be capable of going and affecting the other nodes where you want the changes, right? So to summarize, nonlinear dynamical systems provide a framework for modeling and studying gene regulatory networks. Now, so you're going to model genetic, uh, so you're going to model a biological system, all right, using genetic regulatory networks, all right? Then the question is, which model are you going to use, all right? So model selection will depend on the kind and amount of data that is available and the goals of the modeling and analysis. And whenever you have to do any modeling, you have these classical engineering trade-offs. This has nothing to do with biology, right? So the question is, should I construct a very detailed model, right? And then in the process, I'll have a lot of parameters. It's going to be a very accurate model, but I have a hard time learning the parameters from whatever data is available, okay? So the other option is, it could be a rough model, a coarse model, right? It'll have fewer parameters and lower com complexity, right? So you cannot capture everything. It's not a detailed enough model, right? But on the other hand, you will need a much smaller amount of data to learn that model, right? So the question is, which one should you use, right? Say, for example, this, you know, if you're capturing high-level phenomena in the case of, of genes, okay? So if you're const constructing a detailed model, you might look at the, the gene expression for each and every gene, the evolution of that over time, okay? You're, you're, you're actually looking at the analog value of the gene expression. On the other hand, you could say that I'm going to get a, use a coarser model. Is the gene turned on or off? Okay, and you decide what the threshold is. Okay, beyond a certain a certain value, you will say that the gene is on. Right below that value, you'll say the gene is turned off. Okay, so then it's binarily quantized. You could do it ternally quantized and so on. Okay, and in that case, you by this doing this quantization, you have lost accuracy in the model, but you need a lot less data to be able to describe that system. Right. Because if it's just continuous variables, then you will need more data, right? Because there are many, many more states, right? There's an infinite number of states. If it's discretized, it's a finite number of states, you know? So you are going to need uh, smaller amounts of data. So the question is, what should you do? Now, model selection needs to obey the principle of what is called Occam's razor, right? And that says that the model complexity should be sufficient to faithfully explain the data, but not, not any greater than that, okay? Depends on how much data you have. If you can explain the data with your model, you're happy. Right? So from a pragmatic engineering perspective, this is interpreted to mean that the model should be as simple as possible to sufficiently solve the problem at hand. Okay? And that's what we do in engineering all the time. If you're trying to design a control system, you don't go and model the, the system ad infinitum. All right? You use a reduced order model. Right? That'll make your job easier. Right? So the model should be simple, but not simplistic. Right? It should not be so... It should not be so simple that, you, you know, whatever you come up with is ridiculous, all right? Like, I remember when I was an undergrad, right, they used to teach these linear electronic circuits, all right? And when you're going to linear, and I think that's 325 here, so they will do all kinds of approximations, right? I mean, so all kinds of approximations, you neglect this and all that, and people start saying, you know, this is the basic message in electronics, you know, that anything, you'll just reduce it to one piece of wire, you know? That's, not, that's an exaggeration, you know, but they do make a lot of approximations that, okay, at high frequency, this capacitor is going to short that resistor, so you throw it out, you know, but at the end, you get some result, okay? So you cannot reduce it to that piece of wire because then you can, you, you can learn nothing about the circuit that you started out with, okay? So it should be simple, but, you know, but it should uh, be, you know, ha have sufficient resolution to solve whatever problem you're interested in. So in the context of a functional network, Right? Complexity is determined by the number of nodes. If, if you're looking at a gene regulatory network, right? complexity will be determined by how many genes are there in the network, right? number of nodes. You know, what is the connectivity between the nodes? Is each and every node connected to each and every other node? Right? That will be pretty complex. Right? But if there is sparsity of connection, that will make things easier for you. Then the complexity of the functional relations. Okay? How does this node depend on its predictors okay? or the other nodes that are affecting it? Right? Is that a simple function or is, is that something more complicated? And also the quantization level, okay? In the, in the network, if you're going to quantize things, okay? Are you going to quantize 
uh, the gene expression, right, to three levels, two levels, right, or are you going to quantize it to 100 levels, you know, so depending on the, on the quantization level also, the model is going to be more complex. If you have more quantization levels, it will be a more complicated model. Now, so we are now going to focus on what are called Boolean networks, all right, where, where there is binary quantization. Each gene is assumed to be either on or off, okay, only two states, right. So here we focus on the original deterministic version of the Boolean model, and the more recently proposed stochastic version will be presented a little bit later, right. The Boolean model is archetypical of logical function models, and many of the issues that arise with it arise in other regulatory network models. Because, see, I said that there are other regulatory network models, like differential equations, all right, Bayesian networks, all right, dynamic Bayesian networks, and so on, okay. But we are just focusing on the Boolean model because, you know, similar things can be, similar statements can be made about those other modeling paradigms, too. Now, a key issue is intervention in gene regulatory networks, all right. You're not, you're not mo modeling just for the sake of it, just for building a model and staring at it, okay. You want to do something. You want to be able to affect the state of the system in desirable ways. So, so intervention in gene regulatory networks has been considered in the context of what is called a probabilistic Boolean network, which is a probabilistic generalization of the Boolean model, right. And I will get to it probably, if not today, maybe next time, right. So let's try to see what what a, a Boolean network model involves. So the regulatory model which has perhaps received the most attention is the Boolean network model. Right? This model has been studied both in biology and in physics. This was introduced by a guy in the 1960s. Right? His name is Stuart Kaufman. He, he introduced this in the 1960s. So in the Boolean model, the gene expression is quantized to two levels on and off. Each gene can have one of two states. On means it is being transcribed, right? Off means it is not, not being transcribed, right? So the expression level of each gene is functionally related to the expression states of other genes using logical rules. So using Boolean logic, right? The value, the expression level of, let's say, gene number one at the next time step, right, will be some Boolean function of the expression level of its predictors at the current time step, right? That's the idea. Now, although this binarization into the 0, 1 states provides very coarse quantization. We know that it is commonplace to describe genetic behavior in binary logical language, such as on and off. You say a gene is on or off, upregulated and downregulated, right? Highly expressed, you know, non, or suppressed, and responsive and non-responsive. Okay, so there are many situations where you will uh, characterize uh, the gene activity in, in, in binary terms. And for those, the Boolean network model will be appropriate. Now, we have already done some analysis of gene expression microarrays. You remember the ratio analysis, right, we did? Red over green, okay? So we said that there were three possibilities. Red over green is almost the same, okay? Or red over green is significantly higher than one, significantly smaller than one, right? So there were three possible states, right? So there could be ternary quantization. So in the context of expression microarrays, Consideration of differential expression leads to the categories of low expressed and high expressed, right? If you say about low expressed and high expressed, then you will get what are called binary networks, right? Because there's binary quantization. Or you could deal with the categories like low expressed, high expressed, and invariant, right? So red over green, right, is much larger than one, much less than one, almost one. Okay, so there will be three possibilities. In that case, that would be leading to ternary valued networks that are treated in much the same way as binary networks, and often you refer to these ternary valued networks also as Boolean networks, right? Now, successful application of the Boolean model requires the inclusion of genes whose behavior is essentially binary or bimodal, because you're looking at genes that are either one or zero, right? So they, they have to exhibit binary behavior. Now, it has been demonstrated, and again, I mean, there are papers that have been written on this, okay? So if you, if you look at the, bo at the book, you know, there are references over there. So it has been demonstrated in the context of microarrays that there can be sufficiently many switch-like genes so that binary quantization can be successfully utilized for clustering and classification. So there are many genes that behave in a switch-like pattern, especially, you know, the genes that are involved in the control of cell division, right? What kind of genes are they? Do you remember? Or the proteins that are involved in the control of cell division, what are they? Huh? Go ahead. 
No, no, no. Housekeeping genes are not involved in the control of cell division. Housekeeping genes are involved in, th yeah, in, in, in the routine things, yeah. What are the, what are the genes that are involved in the, in the control of cell division, right? What are the, or what kind of proteins? No, kinases, yeah. You need to, st you're studying, but you need to start ramp it up a little bit, you know, the test is on Monday, okay. Kinases, right? Kinases and phosphatases, all right? So you will see a binary effect over there because if you add the phosphate group, gene is active, okay? If you take out the phosphate group, gene is inactive, right? Or the protein is inactive. So you do see binary switch-like behavior, right? In, in many places, you know. Uh, in fact, we did what is called the tryptophan operon in this class, all right? I don't know, you already took the test on that probably, right, or no? You did? Okay. Yeah, so just like the tryptophan operon, there is something that is called the lactose operon, right? The lac operon, which was discovered by Jacob and Menard in the 1960s, okay? They got a Nobel Prize for that, okay? And what they showed is that if you have uh, bacteria, right? And uh, let's say the regular food source is glucose, all right? So you take glucose away, you replace it by lactose, all right? Then the bacterium starts synthesizing the enzymes that are needed for metabolizing lactose, okay? Because, you, you know, lactose has to be broken up differently than glucose, all right? So normally it doesn't have the ability to do that. But as soon as you, you've taken away that food source, all right, the, the glucose from the environment, put in lactose, all right, it turns on the genes, okay, that are needed for metabolizing lactose, all right? So probably, you know, if you and I were starved, okay, probably we would also turn on some genes. But unfortunately, we are multicellular organisms. We'll be dead before, you know, the genes turn on and, and kick in, you know. So, but but the, the bacteria can do, do that. So that is an example of, you know, binary logic, right? Because the thing turns on in, in, in response to the, the food source. Okay. Now, from the perspective of logical prediction, numerous Boolean relations have been observed in the NCI-60 anti-cancer drug screen cell lines. Well, NCI is na the National Cancer Institute, right? It's one of the, I think, 10 or 12 institutes at the National Institutes of Health, all right? And they have an anti-cancer drug screen, right? So they have cell lines, like, so if, if you develop, let's say, a cancer drug, all right? You don't uh, get to go and test it on people right away, okay? So they have a panel of 60 cancer cell lines because the cancer cells, they are immortal, okay? So they, so they can be made to multiply and you can keep them. So they, NCI has that panel of 60 uh, cell lines, okay, of, of, of cancer cells. So if you come up with a new drug, all right, you first have to show that it works on those cell lines, okay, right? If you pass that, then after that you will go to animal trials, okay, and then you will go to clinical trials. So it's a long way, all right. So if, if it doesn't pass that, then you're out of luck, all right, you're out of business. So they have this, uh, so they call this NCI 60. There are 60 different cell lines from different cancers like colon, breast, you know, ovary and so on, okay. So, uh, so, 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 so these are like the, you know, uh, I wouldn't say gold standard, but it's, it's like a pretty good standard for, uh, you know, testing out anti-cancer drugs. So about seven, eight years ago, right, we got some data from a, a guy who used to be uh, at the National Cancer Institute, right, at that time. And he's a radiation oncologist, right? So if you, if you take cancer cell lines and you zap them with radiation, right, they will express different genes, okay? So he measured those on the microarrays and he gave us that data, okay, which genes, I mean, what is the activity level of the different genes? And so we published a paper in 2005 where we showed that there were many, uh, among the genes that were expressed, right, uh, under the effect of radiation, right, there were many genes that had binary relationships, like this is an or relationship between two of the genes. Uh, so we, we showed that it, like some other third gene is, is looking like an or, or between these two and, an, and this gene is looking, I don't know what those specific genes are, but there, there is an and relationship, okay. So we, in fact, we have a paper on that in uh, bioinformatics, I think it's 2005, right? So Boolean relationships between genes responding to ionizing radiation in the NCI60 anti-cancer drug screen, right? So th this is what is being quoted here, right? So we have seen that there, there is, uh, there is uh, you know, um, Boolean logic uh, can be used to describe relationships between many genes, right? So using classical methods, there is ample evidence demonstrating inherent logical genomic decision making. And this again is an old idea, all right? Because Norbert Wiener in 1948, all right? He conjectured, and he, I'm sure everybody here has heard about Wiener, right? I mean, he's the guy that came up with the Wiener filter, all right? 
So in case you didn't know, he was also interested in another area that is called cybernetics, right? He has a book, I think 1948 or 1946, right? And in that he talks about, you know, the connection between man and machine, okay? That he, yeah, man or animal and machine, okay? That the same kind of logic drives it, okay? And uh, here, let me give you an example. The following figure shows a biologically studied regulatory pathway and its corresponding Boolean representation. See? So here, this CDK7 is cyclin-dependent kinase. So now all of that makes sense to you. You know what is cyclin, right? You know what is cyclin-dependent kinase, okay? These are involved in the control of cell division. So cyclin-dependent kinase will interact with cyclin H, okay? And that will positively affect cyclin-dependent kinase 2. Okay, this is biological knowledge. Now, cyclin-dependent kinase 2, along with cyclin E, right, and P21. P21 is, is a negative regulator on this. So if P21 goes high, this will become low. It will try to hold it back, all right? These guys will together exert an inhibitory influence on the retinoblastoma protein, all right? And this guy, in turn, is basically preventing cells from going into the S phase. DNA synthesis is S phase, okay? In the cell cycle, this control is there, okay? So... So you can see that this relationship here, you can represent using this kind of a logic gate, where this is an AND gate, this is not, this is an inverter, that's an AND gate, right? So cyclin dependent kinase 7 and cyclin H together, the ANDing of that, if these two are active, then that will activate cyclin dependent kinase 2, right? And then these signals will go in, right? Cyclin E will go in, P21 has got to be low so that you get a high signal going in, then that 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 is going to be basically inactivate the retinoblastoma. That's why you have a NAND gate here. Okay, all three together. So, and you can come up with other examples like that, okay? And, and, and this actually agrees with, what, what, see, the biologists are not going to talk about networks. They will say this one affects that one, like, like this kind of diagram they like, okay? It's probably not the complete picture because there might be other things that are acting in here, okay, that you don't know, right? So that's why, you know, in one context they may see this, but in another context they'll see something else, okay? And the thing about biologists is sometimes they will write papers, right? That will write things one way right now. And they, after some, sometimes they do another set of experiments, that's something else. And then they'll write a third paper that will explain both of them, okay? And maybe there is more stuff to add after that, okay? Because it's still not the complete picture. Okay, any questions? So all, all of this is basically providing justification for using Boolean type logic, right? in the modeling of genetic regulatory networks. Right. That's all it is. Right. So, and in words, whatever I showed you in the previous figure, will translate to that for cells to move into the S phase. Again, S is DNA replication, okay, you guys know that. Cyclin dependent kinase 2 and cyclin E work together to phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein and inactivate it, thereby releasing cells into the S phase, right, DNA synthesis phase, and that misregulation can result in unregulated cell growth. If you go and mess up something in this, in the, in this pathway diagram, right, you probably get uncontrolled cell proliferation. Or, you know, before DNA damage has been repaired, you know, the cell, cell is going to multiply. All right, any questions? So, so far it has just been a general discussion. Now we are going to get into some specifics, all right. So we are now going to look at Boolean networks, all right. So Boolean network is described by a set of nodes, right? So it's a graph, right? So a set of nodes V, uh, which has got like, let's say N elements, if you're looking at N genes, X1 through Xn, and a list of Boolean functions, right? F, which has got F1, F2, up to Fn. Each Xk, right? Each node represents the state or expression of a gene, Gk, where Xk is one or Xk equal to zero on whether the particular gene is expressed or not expressed. So it's binary, right? So the Boolean functions represent the rules of regulatory interaction between the genes. Now, network dynamics will result from a synchronous clock, right? And again, the clock may not be synchronous. That'll make life more complicated, right? People have looked at that. You know, there are math guys that are getting in. You know, if you make a synchronous assumption, they will put in asynchronous and write a few more papers. Okay, so people have looked at that. Okay. So ne network dynamics result from a synchronous clock with times t equal to zero, one, two, and so on. And the defining property of a Boolean network is that the, the expression level of the k gene, right, at the next time point is some Boolean function of the expression level of all its predictors at the current time point, okay? And this number can vary, right? 
because this is this is a sparse network. Okay, everything is not connected to everything else, right? So the nodes in the argument of FK they form the regulatory set for XK, right? And again, this number is not going to be large. You know, one reason is because you know, if you're looking at a, a transcription, right, you have RNA polymerase, then you have transcription factors binding, right? If you look at the promoter region of a gene, right, it's not very big. So there is only so many things that can bind, okay? Everything cannot come and bind over there, okay? So that would be the reason why, you know, this number is not going to be large. It's going to be typically maybe two or three, right? Something like that. Two or three factors will affect it directly. It may affect some other things, okay? But direct, direct action will be from two or three factors. So that's a big challenge because whatever models we have for gene regulatory networks right now, those don't take the sparsity into account. You know. Some attempts are underway here to do that, but I'm just saying that, that uh, because, there, so it is true that the biologists uh, don't have the multivariate picture, right? That part is true, okay, they might go wrong. But on the other hand, in our quest to go for multivariate, it doesn't mean we should put in all kinds of connections, you know, when we know a priori that there is sparsity there, okay? So that constraint has to be built into the problem to produce something meaningful. So the numbers of genes in the regulatory sets, they define the connectivity of the network with maximum connectivity often limited. It's usually two or three, right? And at time point t, the state vector, because you have, k, you have n genes, okay? So the state vector is made up of the, of the activity level of these n different genes, so it has got n components. This is called the gene activity profile or gap, right? Now the functions together with the regulatory sets, they determine the network wiring. Right, I, which in turn determines the dynamics of the system, right? Now, a Boolean network is a very coarse model, right? Because you have quantized things to one and zero, right? And that's why a lot of biologists will agree, argue with you. They will say, no, the expression is, a, is an analog variable, right? So that's another battle that you have to keep on fighting, right? But see, you know, they, huh? No, no, that way they can argue, you know, even uh, when we do computations, everything is analog, okay? But if the digital computer works, right? digital control works, right? But in biology, we haven't been able to get to that stage where we can show that, okay, it works, okay, hey, it's time for you to shut up, okay? Just listen to the, to, to the quantization, yeah. We haven't reached that stage, okay? I mean, because these are still models, right? Because connecting them to the real world, because we, see, in the engineering systems, the models will probably be a lot better because, you know, engineers build them, man build them, right? So, but in the case of biological systems, you know, you're making some underlying assumptions. If those are not satisfied, Probably if you do everything, you know, you might run a sophisticated algorithm, but the, the output may not make much biological sense. So that is a real challenge. Really. But yeah, if we could produce the output, then they would not, like, they never argue, okay, with their cell phones, all right? So there's digital communication too, right? I mean, in the cell phones, right? They, they don't argue with that, you know, they happily use the cell phones, right? They don't say that, no, no, it is analog data, you know, you should not be discretizing stuff. So the same thing would probably happen here if you can take things to the finish line. So a Boolean network is a very coarse model. Nonetheless, it facilitates understanding of the generic properties of global network dynamics, and its simplicity mitigates data requirements for inference. Because it's binary quantization, you need a lot less data to infer the, uh, the, the functions in, in the Boolean network. Now, if you have a dynamical system, right? Uh, like if you have a continuous dynamical system, you're going to talk about equilibrium states, right? Because once you get there, you stay there, okay? You don't get out. So similarly here, if you're talking about the steady state behavior of a cell, okay, you have a generic regulatory network, you will talk about what are called attractors, right? So those are the states that once you reach them, you stay in there, okay? That's a steady state, right? And that would be related to the phenotype of the cell, right? So attractors play a key role in Boolean networks, actually in any dynamical system. So given a starting state within a finite number of steps, the network will transition into a cycle of states called an attractor because the number of states, okay, is limited. If you have n genes, okay, each gene is binary, either high or low, right? Express, not express. So you have a total of two to the power of n states, right? So that means there will have to be some attractors, like limit points, all right? You have a finite number of states, okay, and an infinite number of things. So you would have to have some limit points. You know? So... So given a starting state within a finite number of steps, the network will transition into a cycle of states that is called an attractor, and absent perturbation, it will continue to cycle thereafter, right? And each attractor is a subset 
of a basin composed of those states that lead to the attractor if chosen its starting states. Because these attractors, these are like the final states, okay, resting states. So depending on where you start, because this is, see, this is a nonlinear system. If it's a linear system, there will be only one attractor, okay, that will be the zero equilibrium state, right? If it's a linear system, x dot equals ax, okay? No matter where you start, if a is stable, you will go to zero, x equal to zero. Here you will go to different attractors, depending on where you start, okay, because it's a local, the stability is a local property, right? So the basins of these attractors will form a partition of the state space for the network. If you're looking at non-attractor states, those are transient because, you know, you will move from there and ultimately you'll end up in the attractor. So non-attractor states are visited at most once on any network trajectory, okay? You're not going to go back over them. So the figure on the next, so here we are looking at a, at a network, genetic regulatory network with six genes, okay? There is binary quantization. So you have a total of two to the power of six states, okay? Like state zero is all zeros, one is all zeros, and then one, 63 is all ones, all right? So, so you can, you know, draw some transition between these different states, and that's shown on this next diagram, all right? So each state, I have all zeros, okay? I, I represent it by its decimal equivalent, all right? So if it is all zeros, I will, I will call that zero. If it is all zeros, one, one. If it's all ones, it'll be 63. And maybe you could have a structure like this. This is hypothetical, right? But you could have four levels. Like if you start from here, you'll go like this, like this, like this, and then you'll end up in that attractor. This is an attractor. Once you get there, that's it, okay? You stay there. This is another attractor. This is another attractor, right? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, this is fictitious, okay? But in general, if somebody specifies those functions for you, right, like x at k plus 1 equals some function, right, you'll be able to solve for that, okay? Because you'll be able to solve for the each attractor, right, and its basin, okay? And then you'll be able to figure out in how many steps it'll go. Because the, the, the equation for the dynamic evolution of the state is already there, right? X at time k plus 1 equals this. So if you start somewhere you will see where you'll get in the next time step, then the next time step, and so on, okay? So you can figure it out from that. But this is a fictitious one. This is just to introduce the idea of attractors, okay? Then that you, you could have different levels, all right? And actually, it is possible also to have cyclic attractors. Like, you could have something like that is cycling between 32 and 41, okay? Yeah, I, uh, those are called attractor cycles, okay? So it's possible to have that too, but it's not shown in this diagram. So the follow, following figure for, provides a transition flow schematic for a Boolean network containing six genes. There are three singleton attractors, 32, 41, and 55, and there are four transient levels where a state in level K transitions to an attractor in K time points. Right? The attractors of a Boolean network, they characterize the long-run behavior of the network. Right? That makes sense, right? I mean, because once you get there, you stay there. Okay? That's what you will see in the phenotype. Right? And they have been conjectured by Kaufman, the guy who introduced Boolean networks, that the attractors are indicative of the cell type and phenotypic behavior of the cell. I think he did some calculations showing that there can be, you know, if the connectivity K is 2, right? And if you look at the number of genes that you have in, in the genome, uh, that you'll get like 256 attractors, and apparently that is the number of different cell types that you can get, right? So, but again, I mean, this is not proven. Okay, that's a conjecture. Now, real biological systems are typically assumed to have short attractor cycles, with singleton attractors being of special import, or of special importance. For example, it has been suggested, and this is somebody from the Harvard Medical School only a few years ago, right? He, he mentioned that, uh, you know, apoptosis and cell differentiation could correspond to singleton attractors. Because apoptosis and cell differentiation, these are terminal, right? Once you go in there, if a cell undergoes apoptosis, it has died, okay, that's it, right? There's no question of getting out of there. Even cell differentiation also, if the cell differentiates, if it's a stem cell, it's differentiated, that's it, okay, there's no question of going, coming back. So these correspond to singleton attractors and their basins, while cell proliferation, it corresponds to a cyclic attractor, because in cell proliferation, you have the cell cycle, right? M phase, G1 phase, S phase, G2 phase, M phase, and so on, okay, that's the cyclic attractor, right? Now, if you make changes in the Boolean functions, all right, via mutations or or, why, or, or rearrangements, if you make changes, you would change the attractor landscape, right? And that could lead to diseases, like, such as cancer, you know, they, it, it could cause tumors. So changes like that 
are likely to lead to a cancerous phenotype unless the corresponding basins are shrunk by a new rewiring so that the cellular state is not driven to a tumorigenic phenotype or if already in a tumorigenic attractor, the cell is forced to a different state by flipping one or more genes. Okay? So you would want to intervene, right? Assuming that this network modeling is what is, is representing the true state of affairs, okay, then what I should try to do is to restore the network to its original state, or if there are bad attractors that have been created, I'd like to get rid of them, maybe using drugs or something like that. Okay? So the objective of cancer therapy would be to use drugs to, one, to do one or both of the above. So that's where you're going to tie uh, cancer treatment to, uh, with whatever biology that we, uh, we have learned in this course. All right. Yeah, I think let me stop here for, for today, right? Because I'm going to go to the next concept, which is the coefficient of determination. And this will require some, some time, you know. So. And, and I'm going to, for this, I'm going to cover that here. And then I will discuss that other paper. There was another paper that I said I was going to discuss in the class in addition to the notes. Okay, so I will discuss that in detail.